me. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, a Professor of Politics and International Affairs. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, today to introduce Michelle Shepard and Bart Gilman. Uh, I met Michelle Shepard on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, I, first of all, was various things got sent my way that she had written, uh, and then somebody retweeted something that she had tweeted, and I thought, that's really interesting, and I started following her, uh, and we went back and forth occasionally on Twitter, and then we actually met in Dublin uh, at a conference uh, of former violent extremists, everything from Crips and Bloods to Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, which uh, is just, that was actually a kind of benign part of the places that Michelle Shepard hangs out. Uh, but I'm particularly delighted uh, to, to move from the virtual to the real and bring her here. Um, she has her work, uh, she's won many awards, which I'll, I'll tell you about, focusing on terrorism and civil rights uh, and justice. She's won the Michener Award for Public Service uh, Journalism and also twice won Canada's top newspaper prize. Um, she, I should say she's been, she is the national security correspondent for the Toronto Star, you know that. Uh, so the, um, her, her uh, recently released book, which we're going to hear about, a Decade of Fear, Reporting from Terrorism's Gray Zones, we were just chatting about some of the places that she has been reporting from uh, and is still reporting, and they are uh, not easy places. In fact, do your parents like? <laughs> but we will have a chance uh, actually to hear from her. She's been on the front lines. Um, her first book was Guantanamo's Child, The Untold Story of Omar Khadr, who actually we uh, heard about for the 501 uh, students here, uh, which was also voted as one of the most influential books of the year in Canada. Bart Gelman, I think you all know, we now count him, well, he's one of our own and as an alum, uh, but also now uh, as a visiting fellow for the Center for International Security. Uh, he's a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, and blogger and tweeter, I should say. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I will not go through all of his many honors except to say that we are thrilled to have him back here uh, at, on a, as a regular member uh, of the Wilson School community and particularly happy that uh, he's here to interview Michelle. So with that, I will but turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I, we're gonna get pretty quickly to the bigger picture and to some of the more exotic places you've been, but I, I've got to start where you started in your book, uh, it, this, surreal extended scene uh, aboard the um, registered trademark spy cruise <laughs> with two former uh, directors of uh, Central Intelligence uh, talking to you about torture. Okay, well, um, I think over my, uh, my decade, I've always been attracted to um, what I call terrorism's theater of the observed because so often you have these encounters and or you go to these places or talk to people and you can't believe uh, what is actually happening or what you've just heard if you didn't have it on tape recorder. So one of these assignments was um, to go on a spy cruise. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, because I wasn't, uh, apparently this is one of the themed cruises they do. So I, I see some people nodding. Some people have heard of it. Um, so the idea is that you go on a cruise and it's, it's like a cruise like any other through the Caribbean. And uh, part of your day involves talking about terrorism. And it's, a, it's a, quite a surreal experience because you're you know, up having lunch with uh, people in bikinis in the hot tub, and then a few minutes later, you're down in this third floor boardroom talking about Iran. Um, so it was on that cruise, I, I decided to go just to write about what had happened, but the two speakers were two former um, CIA heads. Uh, Michael Hayden and Porter Goss. And so there were only a couple of journalists that were there, so they were very generous with their time. And for a Canadian reporter, you wouldn't have a whole lot of access to these, these figures. And for someone who's covered Guantanamo Bay a lot, um, I really delighted in my time uh, sitting with them in the Lido lounge <laughs> talking <laughs> about terrorism. So it was an unusual setting for some uh, great interviews, I thought. Tell us about Porter Goss and the Salted Nuts. Well, this, the Salted Nuts scene uh, came about in the Silk Den, 
which is on the 11th floor of this massive cruise. And um, this was a night that they both sat with us to describe, uh, to just give, give us an interview. And so I had brought up the issue of uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the waterboarding. And Porter Goss was, was, was starting to get um, exasperated by our questions. And um, he felt that the media had overplayed uh, the impact of what waterboarding actually constituted. So to give um, an example of what it was, he picked up the, the salted bar nuts and during the interview said, do you know what 183 waterboarding sessions is? This is what it is. One, and out came an almond. Two, out came a cashew. And it just sort of added to the surreal nature of, of the experience. <laughs> well, Michael Hayden uh, made an interesting distinction when uh, he's, he's a much better talker than Porter uh, He's a better talker than most people. He, he, uh, he made an interesting distinction on waterboarding between uh, the moral side and the efficacy. Explain that a little bit. That's and, right. And, and tell me what you make of his argument. I mean, he's, a, as you say, inc incredibly articulate and an intelligent man. And, and waterboarding happened before both of them were in their positions, which is you know, worth noting as well. Um, but what, what he had said was that uh, you can oppose to the practice, you can be opposed to the practice, but you can't tell me that it didn't work. And this was his assertion. That you know, as journalists, you can write about it as much as you want. Well, he didn't say it in those terms, but you can you can criticize the practice, and and as a nation, we should discuss that. But you can't say that it wasn't an effective tool to get intelligence. And you know, that's that's always difficult when you're a journalist because th that's a hard thing to test. However, I had spoken to many other people uh, who said that that assertion simply wasn't true. Um, and most recently, uh, Ali Sufan has come out with a book, and he was an uh, FBI interrogator who, who says emphatically that that wasn't true. And he was actually part of the interrogation, not of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, but of one of the other Guantanamo detainees, before it got turned over to um, these teams that did the, the waterboarding. So you're skeptical. You, the, the evidence hasn't been but the evidence isn't out there. Uh, but do you completely buy the honest I mean, do, do you think the absence of evidence uh, is decisive here? I think it's a it's a, a difficult question to answer because you know we only know no we only know what we're we're told, um, and all I can base my answer on is is interviews I've had with with interrogators or intelligence specialists that say um, have told me that those techniques don't work because the information you get is not reliable. Um, but in terms of testing it, uh, it's, it's, you, you won't, let's say, there was a nugget of information that came out which is disputed um, from the, the interrogation of KSM, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, you don't know if that nugget of information would have come out had he not been subjected to that practice. So it's a really difficult, um, it, it's difficult to gauge the the eff uh, effectiveness of it. And what I have seen during my uh, reporting and traveling abroad is sort of the bigger picture of when we talk about controlling the narrative after 9-11. So there's Al-Qaeda's narrative and, and the narrative that, that you know, the West has tried to put forward. And I have seen the damaging impact of waterboarding towards that narrative. So in other words, it's been a gift for Al-Qaeda propagandists. Uh, I want to, maybe this is a little bit curious, talk for a second about what's not in the book. Uh, I, it, it's, it's fairly striking to look at the table of contents uh, which, where the chapter uh, headings begin somewhere at sea. <laughs> it's five years, but you go through New York, Mogadishu, Karachi, Toronto, Guantanamo, Sanaa, Harstad, Norway, uh, and you stop and you think, there's no Iraq and there's no Afghanistan on that list. Now, is that sort of a happenstance of accumulated assignments? I mean, it's one of the things that makes this book extraordinarily interesting and, and that justifies the sort of title of the kind of the, the, gray, the gray parts of the war on terror where you, where, which have not been as much under public notice. I mean, it certainly isn't because 
it was too dangerous to go to Iraq or Afghanistan. So some of the risks you've taken uh, uh, take my breath away as a reporter. Uh, so, so why not? Why weren't you there? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I had a review that came out in Canada, and I won't embarrass the paper, but it actually, part of the review said that they, um, there was some criticism, and part of the review was that the, you know, the stories through Iraq, Egypt, and Afghanistan were interesting. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's curious because I wasn't, <laughs> didn't have any stories from there. But that aside. Um, <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it's the, pra the easiest answer is I, I didn't cover Iraq or Afghanistan. I had colleagues that covered that, um, colleagues that do more um, military reporting. Uh, and, and so that's sort of the simple answer. Um, why I didn't go was, was in part, um, they, didn't, they didn't actually interest me as much. And I don't mean that in a, um, that they're not important. Of course they're essential to what's happened over the last decade. But because at that time they had been, they were being well covered, um, I was looking for opportunities, perhaps for places uh, where there weren't as many journalists, which is what got me onto Somalia and Yemen. And also, I wasn't looking at, at war coverage as much as trying to look at sort of the, the roots of, the root cause of terrorism and uh, what would happen in, in failed states to, or fragile states to um, promote terrorism. So, so really, the, the, the arc of the book is, is really through the travels. And I mean, I, I didn't know anything about terrorism on 9-11. I knew very little. I was a 29-year-old crime reporter covering the Bloods and the Crips when I went down uh, to Ground Zero on the night of 9-11. Of, uh, so, you know, the, I hate the word journey, but the, the book is kind of a journey of me trying to understand that through these countries. Yeah, I mean, this is, I'll just say that, I, and I should have mentioned before, the, the book is for sale, and, and, <laughs> and so we'll be signing it. I, I cannot tell you, it, it's, it's, it's got, scenes and context and insights in it that you just can't find anywhere else because no one else saw this stuff. This is truly someone who went where everybody else wasn't. And uh, that can be extraordinarily valuable in terms of journalism and, and now at, at book length. Uh, so let's give an example here. Uh, tell us about um, Hamid Ghul and your conversation with him. Uh, so what, what, what's his importance? What's the context and how on earth did you find the nerve to compare him to Tony Soprano to his face? <laughs> well, well, I mean, cool might be some way that uh, he wouldn't be necessarily a, a unique character because if you're a Pakistani journalist, he, he does like attention. Um, and, and I don't profess to have exper expertise in Pakistan because it's such a complicated country. Uh, but during one of my, my travels there, it was after the, the WikiLeaks dump where he was fingered as an important <coughs> player uh, in terms of the duplicity with, uh, with what was going on with the ISI and, uh, and the US. And so I just, um, I just called him up to see if he, if he would talk about that. And you know, as an aside, I think it actually has helped me over the years to be a Canadian reporter. Um, there, I think you're seen in a lot of uh, countries as less threatening, and um, perhaps that has helped open the doors in a couple places. Because at that, although he is very friendly with the press, at that time he wasn't giving interviews, um, so I was lucky to get there. And uh, the funniest, um, funniest thing happened when I got there was his son actually helps him and organizes. Uh, his interviews, and, and he said to me, oh, Toronto Star, one of my favorite columnists is from the Toronto Star, and, and mentioned a columnist there. So anyway, maybe that's what helped get me in the door. But um, before I'd gone as well, there had been a, a blog in the Washington Post where he was compared to Tony Soprano. And it was a really interesting, you know, funny piece. Uh, so at the end of the interview, uh, he was saying something, and I said, well, just like Tony Soprano. And he, and he looked at me, and he had no idea who Soprano was. And I tell you another, another surreal moment, but trying to explain who this mob <laughs> boss was to Hamid Ghul, and he wasn't quite getting it. So uh, we just sort of ended at that moment. And, and he also, as we ended the interview, you know, gave me this fatherly pat on the cheek and told me to come back and talk to the world's most dangerous man. That was the other name he was given any time. So it was, 
it was, I'm not, I'm not sure that entry was insightful, but it was certainly memorable. Uh, here, here's how the, the, uh, the dialogue as regarded to the book. Um, he, he, he asked her, who is this soprano? And she finally says, uh, I would say he's a sympathetic villain. <laughs> uh, and he replies, ah, or an unsympathetic hero. <laughs> Which might say something about Hamid Ghul <laughs> in that answer. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's true that he's, uh, he's uh, behind Hakani Network attacks on... Uh, Again, I, mean, I, I wish I had that expertise to know the ins and outs. I don't. Um, I think the, the only reason I would be skeptical about that, and, and this is you know, from what others told me, was he was so far out of the game. Uh, he long retired from the ISI, and he was a rather, in Pakistan, he's a rather prominent figure. So it would be surprising that he would have um, that type of connections only because he would be closely watched and he's well known. Um, and then someone else had mentioned to me that they, it could have been a dubious report because in Afghanistan he still had uh, quite the name and they surmised perhaps that was somebody trying to pass on intelligence that you know, wasn't really reliable. Um, but whether he was or wasn't, we've seen lots of proof of other, other members. Right. Uh in Pakistan, when you talk about the uh, federally administered tribal areas, uh, people say to you something that they say, uh, well, a lot of people, and I've heard so many times about this sort of the, uh, the, the Pashtun uh, code of honor mm -hmm. uh, that sort of absolutely requires hospitality and protection of your guests. Uh, and this is often cited as the explanation for uh, harboring Taliban and Al Qaeda folks. And I've always wondered, is that really is that is that what's going on here? Is it about uh, is it about hospitality or is it not something else? <laughs> no, I, I mean I think it's way more complicated than that. But I but I do think that you know that is one factor and uh, and is what makes that region unique. And I mean w when I went, m my one time only time there was actually to a, um, a military base, and the hospitality extended to the fact that I was one of the first female journalists up there. Um, I was at ten thousand feet looking down on the border with Afghanistan. And in my honor, they had erected a woman's latrine tent. <laughs> so that was the first thing I, I saw when I was there. Anyway, just a silly story. But, um, but the, I mean, there's no doubt that that is, that is an integral part of the culture. But uh, as you said, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Well, since you bring it up, talk a little bit about what it's like to be a woman working in uh, these parts of the world, which are you know, far from uniform. but. Uh, which have a variety of uh, different attitudes uh, towards women. Uh, and, and you know, this comes at a time when uh, there have been some you know, quite uh, uh, scary stories about uh, female reporters uh, in the Arab and Islamic world. Uh, how did you experience that? Did, did it help? Did it hurt? Did it make things more dangerous? I've been really lucky. I don't think it's ever, it's ever hurt. I think, if anything, it's been a, a benefit in so far as I'm able to interview women. And, and it opens up you know, half the population in, in many countries where uh, my male colleagues can't interview women. There's also been instances I've had, um, and, and I don't want to overstate you know, the danger that I've been in these, in these countries, really. I'm not you know, a, um, a war correspondent. Uh, often these countries I'm staying in <laughs> nice hotels and uh, you know have it's it's not it's not at a time I tend to be places before uh, a lot of conflict breaks out as opposed to during conflict but um, there have been times where it has been uh, a bit dangerous and I would say that um, men have actually come to to protect me in a way that perhaps my male colleagues wouldn't have been so um, I feel lucky. I think you have to be, it's, it's dangerous wherever you go, but I haven't had any, uh, any problems. And, and, and for the beat that I do too, it's really interesting because um, you know, I've interviewed, I think, th two or three uh, people who are on the UN terrorism watch list, and um, you would think that they would be opposed to having uh, a female interview them. And certainly in their own society, they would not tolerate a local woman uh, coming to their home, speaking to them. But I, I guess for me, it's always been if, if they've agreed to do an interview with me, they've agreed to do an interview with a Western journalist. 
and they, they have something they want to say. And so at that point, you know, gender doesn't matter. And, and maybe, again, Canadian citizenship has helped. I don't know. But do you think you get you, them a sense that you have this sort of exotic, uh, otherworldly <laughs> status in a way because you can, you, can, you can speak to them as an equal and in challenging ways? I mean, did it help you get away? I, on a first date, I for sure would not have asked uh, Ghoul if he was uh, a lobster. <laughs> uh, I mean, did, did, does it help you get away with that? Um, Maybe. I, I, I mean, every journalist comes to stories with their own strengths and uh, weaknesses. And I, I think I'm probably, um, I'm not seen as very intimidating. And uh, maybe that has helped people let their guards down. Um, and I'm I just, I just not really afraid to ask anything, which has helped me have some interesting answers on questions. You went looking for... Uh Anwar al uh in 2009 in Yemen, uh, the same al who recently died in a drone strike, uh, although the US government officially does not confirm or deny that. Uh, tell us about that trip and, uh, and your sense of who al was. Well, I, I went to, uh, to Yemen in the summer of 2009, and this was before the Fort Hood shooting or the underwear bomber or um, the stories that brought attention to Yemen. And, and actually the purpose of the trip was to write about the uh, Guantanamo detainees. And at that point, there was the issue of whether or not they were going to return to Yemen. And uh, I was investigating that. And as an aside, I thought I would go after this guy named Alaki. Uh, and, and he really wasn't on the radar at that point. There had been a Washington Post piece about him and, and maybe two or three articles. He had come up in a Toronto case we had uh, in 2006 where um, eight, they call it the Toronto 18 case where a so-called homegrown plot plotted to blow up the downtown Toronto and, and it was a huge case there. And Alaki's name had come up. So, so, we, so we asked around and um, it was amazing. In, in Sanat, nobody knew who he was. And um, they all knew his father. His father was a prominent diplomat at, at one point and um, Fulbright scholar, well-known figure, but really nobody knew the son. And speaking to those who knew at that time about uh, Al-Qaeda and their peninsula's hierarchy, he did not factor in. He wasn't even in the top 10. Um, so it was really interesting to, to see that and then to watch how he became this figure that eventually was labeled as terrorist number one. And I, and I always say it's my, my biggest journalism regret that I didn't go after him harder because I almost feel at that point there was a possibility that you could have got an interview with him. He's a very savvy uh, preacher and he might have agreed to do an interview with a Canadian journalist to get his message out. And then once Fort Hood happened, there was no way you could get near him. So but here again, you have the issue of uh, corroboration and of how do you weigh, you can't say the public claims because the uh, US government has been prepared to say very, very little openly uh, about uh, Alaki. Uh, but the accusation, mm -hmm. when seeking uh, not for quotation by name, uh, has been that he was not only an Al Qaeda propagandist, but had operational roles in the underwear bomb case in Fort Hood and in others that he, that he was somehow directing and controlling uh, attacks on US interests. How, how do you sift those claims? How do you, how do you try to verify that? It's, it's really difficult. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with whether or not enhanced interrogation techniques and waterboarding worked. It's, it's really hard to, to judge those claims at this stage. And the, the title of operational is a relatively new claim. Um, perhaps we'll see some of that come out with the trial uh, now underway with the underwear bomber. And I look forward to that. I mean, I want to see proof that he had gone to an operational role because I think it's an important distinction in understanding who he was and his, and his influence. Now, you, you, uh, you take the conversation in your book, you take it in a different direction as well. Uh, even if he was an operator, uh, you raised some real doubts about whether, uh, whether singling him out 
and going after him uh, serve U.S. interests. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a nobody, as far as you could tell, in 2009. What happened, what happened after that and why? Well, he was huge. And, and people who had never heard of him suddenly had heard of him. And, you know, I don't want to be disingenuous at the, not admitting the media's role in this as well. I mean, we help create uh, different people and different situations. And definitely it was the, the coverage of him that, that helped give him notoriety. But it was this, this um, declaration that he was terrorist number one and that it, he became the first uh, American citizen to be on the so-called kill list. I think that really elevated his status. And, and it goes back to this, this um, question of the narrative. And I think we're going to see this come up more and more in, uh, when we're talking about counterterrorism. And this was certainly at uh, what was discussed at the, the conference in Dublin where I met uh, Anne-Marie, and that's about, you know, so much of this about the next generation of um, those who support the Al-Qaeda ideology. How do you stop that? And, you know, I would argue that in the last 10 years, we've absolutely lost that narrative, that we've made it too easy for the group to recruit. So it goes into, into that, I think, um, in terms of how al was elevated to this status. So after... He, came, he became so prominent in the, in the sites of the U.S. government and the U.S. media. Uh, it wasn't just that he became a big name over here. He, he, uh, became legit, he had a legitimate following in Yemen that became significant. I'm not sure he had a, 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 a big following in, in Yemen, but I think um, definitely uh, he, he had a following in Canada, the U.S., Britain, elsewhere. I mean, he became sort of a, a, a hero-like figure to a lot of um, disenfranchised youths. And I, mean, I've, I sat and listened to all his, his recordings, and you can see why. I mean, he was an absolutely, pers you know, per he was a powerful speaker. And he, I always laugh every once in a while. He, not say persuasive. So I, I, I wasn't going to say persuasive, but I was choking on that. He was a powerful speaker. And, um, and you know, uh, the first time I watched through the videos, around the, the Toronto 18 time, the time of that trial, uh, I had to laugh because he had almost this, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but he had all these kind of down-to-earth Sarah Palin-like sayings. He would talk about Joe Sixpack on the video and all these sort of I'm one of you-like sayings that really related to the, the, these, these kids later said they really could relate to. I'm not calling Sarah Palin an Al Lackey supporter. I can say this sort of thing in Canada, but... <laughs> I'm just going to leave that one. Yeah. Uh, you guys can ask follow-up on that in the Q&A. Uh, but there's another aspect here, which is, which is the use of U.S. drones. It's the, it's the existence of a kill list. It's the idea... That, let's leave aside for a minute that he's an American citizen. It's the idea uh, that the strategy <coughs> for combating al-Qaeda or combating terrorism prominently includes discovering its leaders and, and knocking them off one by one. Uh, in the earliest days after 9-11, there, there was this sort of debate in and out of the U.S. government about whether, you, whether your, your strategy is to cut the head off the snake. I mean, there was this war of silly analogies, frankly. Uh, cut the head off the snake or, or drain the swamp go after the grassroots and the underlying networks of support. Right. And I think presidents seem to have found it now two in a row um, uh, irresistible uh, to go after the head of the snake, to, to identify someone, say, that, that's a center of gravity of this organization. If we can, we can kill him, then we've made big progress. What, what, what's your sense of that? What's your reporting tell you on that? Well, I mean, I, there, there's, no, there's no doubt that there is you know, a, a place for, for military intervention and, and actions in, in combating terrorism. Um, but there is no way that killing al-Laki has, has affected what's happening in Yemen at all, I would argue. Um, in terms of, of AQAP there, I, I, I believe it would have very little impact on the organization. Uh, and I think it's, you know, for, for all the attention that goes towards that, there's very little attention being played to the root causes in, in Yemen, and that's what has to be um, address. There is no way that AQAP will be um, controlled uh, 
if you don't have a stable government there. Right. Uh, then that's a, I mean, that's a larger <coughs> discussion. But, but I, I, from, from those who follow AQP closely, um, the situation in Yemen seems to have not been changed significantly by Al-Aqi's death. No, I mean, so we're, we're talking about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and uh, it was not very big in sort of the, the consciousness of the US public, and it wasn't actually very big in uh, counter-terrorist circles either, I think, in the early days after 9-11. Uh, did it, in fact, rise to become a, a, more, a more significant threat operationally? Well, you know, is, is, it a, is it a legitimate threat, and what is it for its growth? Well, if you, if you speak with many people in Yemen, they don't think it even exists. Um, I, I don't believe that. I think there is definitely a presence. I think we've had uh, cases where they've shown that they can effectively target, try to target the U.S. Um, What's the example of doing that? Well, if, well, we will see in terms of what happens with the, um, the underwear bomber case. But if there was a, a direct uh, tie to what was happening in, in Yemen and direction from Yemen, then that could be an example. Um, I, they're definitely a threat, but I think you know the the way that it's being looked at now is probably not the most effective way to fight it. And, and I think part of the problem is when we we talk about uh, Al Qaeda now and these various groups is we tend to talk about it all as one subject, um, whereas Al Qaeda now really is three separate discussions. One is what's left in. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. One are the, the franchises, Yemen, Somalia, elsewhere, which are very unique. And then the third is what we're talking about with al-Laki, which is this idea of al-Qaeda, the ideology. And that could go towards the lone wolf scenario or homegrown terrorism. Can you talk a little bit about Somalia? I, I, I don't know how you experienced it. For me, it was, uh, it was probably the, the, the hairiest, scariest place I've ever work. It's the only place I've ever um, uh, put uh, hired gunmen on my expense report. <laughs> uh, what, how, what was it like to work there, and, and what did you find that interested you in Somalia? Well, Somalia has always fascinated me and, and, and really breaks my heart because it's, it's one of the saddest, you know, one of the saddest places. Uh, in Canada, it's also a very important uh, story because we have one of the world's largest diaspora of uh, Somali refugees and, and residents. Uh, I first went there in, in 2006 when uh, there was a group called the Islamic Courts Union that was in power. And I was, I was very scared to go because I had images of Black Hawk Down in my head. Um, in fact, the journalist who took the photo that won the Pulitzer of the American, dead American soldier being dragged through the streets. A friend of mine who works at the Toronto Star. I think it's the only time a Canadian journalist has won the Pulitzer. Um, so that photo actually is in my newsroom in the hall. And every time I walk to my desk, I walk by that. So that was my image of Somalia. I was, I was understandably scared to go. Um, but I'd been told by so many of my Somali friends, this is, this is unlike it's been in two decades. There's actually peace. Um, and in what you were hearing out of Washington and, and London and Ottawa was that it was the African Taliban <coughs> that had taken over. So, in fact, my first visit there, I was completely surprised because, aside from a couple um, perhaps frightening incidents, it was, there was actually, in terms of what happens in Somalia, there was actually order. You could get around. People were out on the streets. Um, Unfortunately, that message of what was happening there and the potential to negotiate with some of the leaders in power then, the more moderate leaders, was not getting back to the West. And uh, what happened after that was a disastrous invasion, uh, two years of war, and the last time I was there um, was, was last year, and it was absolute bedlam. Really, the only way you could go as a foreign journalist uh, especially coming from afar, was to embed with the African Union forces. Today we have a bit of a different situation and obviously the famine which has changed it again. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating country, it's one that's going to keep getting more important and I hope, I hope stays in the news uh, because the famine there is absolutely devastating and I don't think that has, that has really been brought home to people yet.
you, uh, you spoke that year in Somalia with uh, a, a big figure in the Shabab, uh, Sheikh Dair Hassan Awey, did I understand how you say his name? Uh, talk about that. You know, what, what did you learn there? Well, that was another, another surreal day. We were really lucky that he decided he wanted to, to speak with us. Uh, he was one of the ruling members of the ICU at the time, but he was considered one of the radical members. The Islamic Courts? Sorry, this is the Islamic Courts Union that, that had, were, had basically taken over Mogadishu at that time, and they were um, fighting with the transitional federal government at the time. But they had brought peace to, a, a semblance of peace to Mogadishu at that time. <coughs> People were worried about uh, a ways though because he had a radical background and um, he, he, he agreed to an interview and um, the vaudevillian moment of that interview was when we were leaving and he started shouting and I thought we were in real trouble and I just and I later found out through the translator that he really enjoyed liked my blundstone boots <laughs> I, thought, I think he thought it was pretty funny that I was wearing them and as I wrote in the book I was almost tempted to give them to him and walk out because I was glad he wasn't angry with us. But um, the interview we had, I mean, he, he denied any connections to Al-Qaeda, a lot of the uh, allegations that were coming out in Washington at the time. And, and I mean, of course, I was skeptical of the claims because he had had this background. Um, but one of the things he said was, you know, just, we've brought peace here, just, just give us a chance. And um, he wasn't, they weren't given that chance. And now he's one of the leaders of the Shabaab. <laughs> Sorry, I've skipped about three years of history in there, but um, what ended up happening was when Ethiopians <coughs> troops came into Somalia uh, with the blessing of the West, um, so the Shabaab actually became this massive force to fight them because uh, Ethiopia is an you know, arch enemy of, of Somalia. And so it became not a battle of um, anything to do with terrorism in the minds of most Somalis, it was, a, or anything against the West, it was a nationalistic battle to, to oust the Ethiopian troops. And after two years of terrible bloodshed, they did. Uh, in that period, however, the Shabaab grew into a massive organization. Many people left, when, left the organization when Ethiopia withdrew. People in Toronto that I know who went over and fought and came out but many stayed, and uh, Awais was one of them, and then he became, then the Shabaab pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda, and now he's a member. One of the places, maybe the place, where you spent the most time uh, in the course of this narrative uh, is a little piece of a Caribbean island uh, <laughs> called Guantanamo. Yes. Uh, it, you went there, what, 23 times, I think? 23 times so uh, far, yeah. You were thrown out. Uh, yes. What, what, tell us about that and what you were doing there and, and, and why the U.S. military rejected you. I was one of four journalists that in 2002 the Pentagon banned from Guantanamo. Uh, m one of the reasons that I went so many times was that I was following the trial of Omar Khadr, the Canadian there. And so it was a, during a pretrial hearing for, um, for him. And uh, one of the, the witnesses was a former interrogator who had been court-martialed and uh, for his role in the death of a detainee in Afghanistan. And his story was quite well known. He was actually part of an Oscar-winning documentary about the case in Afghanistan at a Wikipedia site. And two years before this trial, I had tracked him down and he had given me an on-the-record interview saying, uh, the Qatar case was different. I'm looking forward to testifying to clear my name. That was the exact <coughs> quote, to clear my name. However, when we were there in 2010, uh, one of the things journalists have to do in Guantanamo before we're allowed on the plane is sign a series of ground rules. And we have fought them for years because some of them are absolutely ridiculous. And they're restrictions and we have to sign it and say we'll comply, otherwise we can't get on the plane to go. And somebody in Washington that week, we had written about this interrogator and we had used his name, Joshua Klaus. He, I had an interview with him two years before. Uh, somebody in Washington said that he was somebody who had, um, his identity was protected as per the ground rules, that we couldn't identify him. Uh, so on the night before we left, the four of us who had used his name, 
um, because we didn't feel we had learned that information in Guantanamo, which was part of the ground rules. You couldn't identify someone whose identity had been re revealed in Guantanamo. Had him been, I'd interviewed him two years earlier. Uh, on the eve of our departure, uh, we got called out and were told the four of us had a lifetime ban, we couldn't come back. So, so this was under the Obama administration. So we appealed, um, we hired a lawyer, uh, Pentagon Press Association uh, helped us, you know, the Washington Post wrote an editorial about it, New York Times, Harper Magazine, and, and so what ended up happening was they, they withdrew the ban. Um, they agreed that we hadn't broken the, the ground rule. And in fact, within I think it was three or four months of going from banned, we were then invited to the Pentagon to advise a room of officials about how the relationship between the media and the military could be better. And, <laughs> and how we should perhaps look at revising these, these ground rules, which was great on their behalf. I mean, we'd been asking this forever, but you know, we, had, we sort of had a little chuckle on the fact that we had gone from you know, persona non grata to these advisors to Jay Johnson and others. Um, and I'll never forget that. Jay Johnson, <laughs> chief, uh, the general counsel uh, the defense department. Thank you. Uh, I'll never forget that meeting too because we had sort of talked beforehand. It was a huge room in the Pentagon and we had talked beforehand about having the lawyers speak. I mean, we, we knew all the things we wanted to have, have revised. And, um, and so we were just gonna be there, and two of us, the two of the reporters who had been banned were there, so we were just gonna be there if there were any questions. And at the beginning of the meeting, <laughs> Jay Johnson said, oh, well, we've got the reporters here, I don't wanna hear from you. What do you two have to say? And it was slightly intimidating, and I remember at the beginning of uh, the meeting, you know, saying, well, it's just a little, and like being kind of nervous, and by the end of the 90 minutes, the two of us were saying, and another thing, why do you ban pictures then? And we sort of had it all out, so. Um, the problem is that you don't really speak the same language, right? You refer in your book to Gitmo Gap. What, what's okay. that, what's an example of that? Well, I, I mean, to be fair, there's many public affairs officers over the years that I, that I have gotten to know, I like, and I feel sorry for, because they're sort of told to, to enforce these, these edicts. Um, and, and just naturally, journalists and, and uh, military don't really go together. I mean, we, our job is to ask questions and you know, challenge authority, and, and their job is not to. So, <laughs> typically. Um, so, Gitmo Gab is sort of this language that for a long time was kind of enforced on us so that every time we referred to the facility as a, a prison, we would be corrected that it was a detention center. And um, the one that always killed me was when you were going through uh, tours of the facility, uh, they wouldn't talk about interrogations, but they called them reservations. And I just refused to write an article that a detainee was brought for a reservation. But this was sort of the language of the military. And, and it was... Um, My favorite was what they called the hunger striker. Uh, didn't, you, didn't you talk oh, about that? Oh, it yes. wasn't hunger, it wasn't being force fed. It was, and I can never say this word, en enteral feeding. I think I've said that correctly. Right, and, and, and this committed suicide? Asymmetric warfare. Um, yeah, so suicide was asymmetric warfare against the United States. Right, so I mean, it, it is. It was, I mean, it was just, this was sort of the, again, talk about narrative, but this was the narrative. And, and you know, it, it just, it, it always, I, made me shake my head because it always had the opposite effect that, that would be, we would be so offended by sort of being talked to like this, especially those who go all the time and, and have had this tour many times, um, that we weren't gonna comply with this language that was being used. But, but Guantanamo over the years has been a really, uh, really frustrating uh, assignment as a journalist. I mean, I've never loved or hated an assignment more just because you are so controlled when you're there. And I still don't feel, you know, despite the many, probably few hundred stories I've done on it, I still don't feel, you know, I've adequately uh, described it. And, and now, unfortunately, I think there's real Gitmo fatigue. And I say unfortunately because, you know, we're having the most important trial, I would argue, since 9-11 that's going to be held there next year. Which is? The trial of uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the four other uh, alleged conspirators of 9-11. And uh, I was actually in Guantanamo the night of Obama's inauguration. And 
I was among the, the foolhardy journalists who was sort of saying my goodbyes to the place because I, I thought that was the end of it when he signed that executive order to close it. And I knew it would be difficult, but you know, it was the time of Obama mania and uh, everyone believed, some of us believed, um, that, that that would actually happen. And obviously it hasn't closed. There's a lot more that I, I can ask and, and will if people don't step forward, but I thought I'd open it up to the floor and if anybody would like to come down to, uh, to a microphone, please just uh, say your name, ask a question. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you uh, time to uh, work out your courage uh, and I'll, uh, I'll ask one more to, to, keep it, to keep things going, but I would really encourage you to, uh, to ask questions. Why don't you, why don't you come on down to the... I, mean, I, I speak pretty loudly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more about what your experience has led you to believe are the root causes of terrorism. You mentioned the unstable government in Yemen, but I'm sure you have some more ideas that I'd love to hear. Likewise, you mentioned um, that the U.S. has made it too easy for terrorist organizations to recruit. So in your mind, and again based on your experience, what would be the elements of an effective um, strategy to combat terrorist recruitment? Well, that easy question. <laughs> so the question was, I'm sure you've heard, but the question was, you know, what are the root causes, what are, to expand on the idea of what the root causes are and then what um, the solutions can be. And uh, I was joking before this session because I said, you know, we're journalists. We don't offer solutions. We just, we just criticize what's been, <laughs> what's been going wrong. And it's, a, you know, a nice, nice position to be in. Um, and, uh, and I look to all of you to finding those solutions. But um, to try and answer the, the question, you know, I, I, for me it really does go back to the narrative. And um, the fact that we still are looking at this issue, uh, in many cases, strictly from a military point of view. And, and, to, and to go back to the example of Olaki, uh, even let's say he is a much more important figure in a QAP than, we're, than we presume. He did have an operational role, let's say that those assumptions are there. Uh, I don't feel by, by getting rid of one leader after another, are you, you're going to, to stop you know, the next generation of recruits. Um, so unfortunately, it's, it's you know, not the, the sexy answer, it's the, it's the long road answer, but it, it's, it's about bringing stability to these countries and helping bring stabilities and not imposing policies that tend to exasperate the problem. So the other, my other reluctance is, one, I mean, I don't feel I have the expertise to offer the, you know, the, the solutions for this, but also that each country is so unique. And, and again, that has been part of the problem, that we tend to look at counterterrorism policies as, um, you know, under the umbrella of, of counterterrorism policies, whereas what Somalia needs is different from what Yemen needs, is different from what is needed in Algeria and elsewhere. Wait a minute. Well, I think, so the question was, I'm sure again everyone heard, the question was, you know, how do you, this, this gives me a few extra minutes to think of the answer when I repeat the question for you. The, the, question, the question is, you know, how do you go about um, building the stability and for the U.S. to uh, get back a credible reputation or to get a credible rep reputation if, as I've argued, you know, so much of that moral high ground has been lost in the last 10 years. I, I, I think the Arab Spring offers an opportunity for that. Um, and again, it's too early to assess uh, where that is headed, but I think one of the things it has taught us is that uh, we can't look at these countries solely through the, the prism of terrorism, which has been really what's driving much of the foreign policy over the past 10 years. 
and 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 that's why we have supported um, you know the policies that we've now you know have been laid to bear in Syria and Egypt um, elsewhere. Um, in Yemen, the, uh, President Saleh has been very adept over the years in using that to stay in power. And, you know, just will put the counterterrorism uh, carrot out there um, every once in a while to get funding. And I think he's still trying to do that today. So I think it's just broadening the, the scope, I guess. Again, it's, I mean, it's a rather surface area. Um, or surface uh, response, rather. Uh, I think it's, um, I, I don't feel I probably have the expertise to, <laughs> even in the countries where I have traveled extensively, to lay out the, um, the way forward. Well, you, you, have, you have one uh, uh, sort of discussion on this in your book that I think maybe you, um, would, would be helpful to bring up here. I mean, maybe a little bit unexpectedly, your last chapter is on the Arab Awakening, and you talk about the, uh, the, the, the shift and the dilemma of uh, U.S. policy in which uh, threats emanating from some country uh, tempt policymakers to embrace a rather oppressive government uh, and, in fact, to sort of ramp up the repression in some ways right. in order to combat terrorists uh, versus, uh, versus encouraging uh, uh, sort of modernization and liberalization and uh, and, understand, and, and understanding the countries. I mean, Somalia was an example of that. You had a group that was called um, the Islamic Courts Union that was, that was getting uh, this label of, as the African Taliban. And you were only getting the, the rhetoric from what was going on there. Uh, whereas if, if policymakers had, had taken time to look at what was happening there and the stability, why they had been able to bring stability and work with the moderate forces within that group, uh, I would argue you wouldn't have the Shabab as what it is today. And so there was an example that, um, you know, we have to get past sort of the, the, the alarm and this politics of fear that has driven so much of it uh, to really look at, you know, what can be done in each country. Who else? Anybody? Uh... Well, I have a question. Oh, no. <laughs> Look at that, she's going to use the mic. <laughs> well, I want to make sure everybody can hear me. So one of the things that we've been talking about uh, in, in the class on politics and public policy is, is, eth is ethics and ethics and public policy. And I, I was struck several times you said, well, you know, I was trying to get the interview. Uh, he wanted the interview so he could get his message out. Right. And I wondered if you would reflect on the fact that you're then the megaphone for the terrorist message. And so you're simultaneously telling us, you know, we, we, we focus on terrorism, we see this through the lens of terrorism, but for you to do your work, you're playing a role in that and you're enabling, you know, a, a deadly organization. So I right. ask you to reflect on that. <laughs> Is this because I said the Sarah Palin comment earlier? <laughs> And I don't get to repeat that question. So the question was, am I enabling a terrorist organization? <laughs> and should I be arrested upon return to Canada? Um, it's a great question, because it is one that I think of often. Um, and I look back on some of the stories I've done, especially early days, and I, and I re regret the simplistic nature with which some of them I told. I would say that even for my first trip to Yemen, I regret some of what I wrote in terms of, or maybe not what I wrote, but in terms of how we packaged it. And I do talk about that a little bit in the book, um, that it was the alarmist nature that I've said we cannot do. But I guess the, the, the bottom line for me is always that I don't think anybody talks to me because they like me or because they, they, they you know, are trying to help me out. Everybody who talks to me has a message to give out. And that sounds terribly cynical, but, but that's, I think, the best mindset to go into that. So I would apply, and not to, not to equate it, but any time I speak to somebody within the intelligence community, I assume that they're leaking me something for a purpose. And I'm very skeptical. I try as much as I can never to use unnamed sources. I rarely, rarely will use that. Um, because I think that affords a level of protection that, that people shouldn't have. But I guess the, the important point is to put what's being said in context 
and, and to always question it. But it's, it's a valid question and, and one that I do revisit a lot because there are pieces that, um, sure, there, it's inevitable that it glamorizes it to a degree. And, and I think maybe, although I, I'm not sure I've ever th thought of it this way, um, but maybe part of the reason that I, I enjoy these stories about um, you know, terrorism's theater of the absurd is partly because I think you know, that is part of the narrative and sometimes we over glorify uh, what's happening whereas you know, one of the most brilliant books I've read was Looming Tower by Lawrence Wright and part of what I loved about that was you know, his descriptions about this, this ridiculous organization and the infighting of the early days of Al-Qaeda and it sort of makes you, it, takes, it strips it of its glamour. <coughs> I mean, since you're uh, since since you're defending yourself uh, uh, <laughs> on whether you're a, 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 a terrorist sympathizer, <laughs> a toddler, and an enabler, uh, maybe you should tell the story. I mean, I, I I think that there's there's no doubt in the book that you understand that some of these people are really bad guys doing terribly evil things. Uh, tell us what brought you to Norway. Oh, the the Norway story. This was both a journalism low and a journalism high. And the, the low came in January 2010 when I was in Mogadishu, and this was during a terrible time. And I met a 17-year-old boy whose name was Ismail Abdul, uh, Khalif Abdul, and he had refused to join the Shabaab. So what they did uh, to teach him a lesson and to use him as an example was drag him into a stadium and amputate his hand and then as he passed out, took off his foot. Uh, and I met him six months after this happened. And you know, you meet so many people in this business that with terribly sad stories, and a lot of people stay with you. And I don't know what it was about Ismail in particular, but he just completely devastated me. And I remember leaving, and it was one of those awful He's cases. How old? 17. And he just was, you know, really he was shaking as he was telling the story and sweating and I was trying to take pictures and I was you know, crying myself and, and he was just so, so sympathetic and, um, and then as I was leaving, it was one of the, because everything in Modishu then happened so fast and you know, here I am in my flak jacket and my helmet and he's in, you know, sitting there on a couch probably after I leave, I don't know where he's going and um, as I left he was saying, begging me to take him to Canada and he looked on my bag and there was a little Canadian pin. And um, so I, I, you know, took the, I was like, do you want this? And so I gave him the pin and my last image of him was down on his, he dropped it and he was trying to find it. And I was, I'll probably start crying telling this story now. Um, but it was a really terrible story and it just showed, um, you know, what the Shabaab was doing that, then, which is just so barbaric, you can't imagine it if you don't see it. Uh, so, I, so I got back to Nairobi, eventually back to Toronto, wrote this story. And it just touched many um, Somali Canadians. And one in particular, this amazing former journalist, uh, Sahal Abdul, who's a Somali Canadian, who was living in Nairobi. He actually had given up journalism because he'd survived a bomb attack that killed a friend of ours. And um, he decided, he'd been trying for years to help Somali, and he decided, okay, I can't help Somali, but I'm gonna help this kid. And so with, along with a, um, some, some people from the diaspora in Canada, they, they did this escape plan for Ismail. And I went back nine months later and was in Nairobi after Ismail take this, had, took this three-day journey to escape and um, was there when he met up with Sahal, wrote that story, went back to Canada thinking, oh, it's gonna be a long time before he gets refugee status and he's still at risk in Nairobi because there's a big Shabab element. And two months after that, three months after that, got a call from Sahal and said, Norway's taking him. And you know, we were both excited. And this is one of those stories where you, you start to cross the line as a journalist, right? Because you're supposed to always be these sort of cold observers. And I was definitely connected to this story. And um, so after our sort of jubilation, we both said, Norway. <laughs> <laughs> this is, and not only, you know, he wasn't going to Oslo, he was going to Harstad, which is 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. <laughs> and this was January when he was going. And this kid had never been outside of Mogadishu until he got to Nairobi. And in Nairobi, he was blown away. I, mean, I have this video of him in the, the mall, just you know, going, wow, wow, seeing mannequins and looking at me, like not believing this and looking back. 
Anyway, so very, so sorry, long story long, um, I ended up then in January going with Sahal and, um, and Ismail on the flight to Harstadt and seeing him see snow for the first time and, and trying to explain to him what the midnight sun was and he was very concerned what would happen in Ramadan, you know, when it's summer and he's like, I'll never be able to eat and so <laughs> he said, I think we'll, we'll, we'll worry about that later, I think they, there's probably some concession here. And uh, he's still there, he's doing, Norway has the most beautiful program for refugees and they really support them. And so he's got an apartment, he's going to university and he's, um, or to, to, sorry, to school, hopes to go to university. He's doing really well. He's my Facebook friend. <laughs> I wish I could answer that question. I, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant because really my only involvement with um, the, the Arab Spring was the month I spent in Yemen at the beginning of the, the protests there. And, and the only reason I'm <laughs> going to dodge this question um, is because one of the things I think I'm often critical of is what we have in the media, sort of security analysts that, that we hear so often from, and they they flip between speaking of Egypt one day and Syria the next day and, and Yemen the next day and, and each country is so distinct and complicated that I'd hate to be <laughs> criticized as being one of those. I mean, I guess, so I guess the only way I can answer is I, is I hope so. Um, I think it's, it's changing so quickly. Um, I, I haven't been particularly impressed <laughs> with the reaction in Yemen. Um, but I, I would feel that you know, I wouldn't be the right person to answer the question on Egypt, which is really where so much attention is right now, of course. Sorry. Actually, could you build on that? Um, the last 10 years when you've been covering terrorism has been an interesting time for newspapers in general. Um, and then, and um, so as the world gets more complex, we right. seem to have a, a diminishing uh, amount of coverage or quality of coverage. So from where you sit, what do you think the media does well when it comes to the issues you cover? And then, you know, where are their gaps? I think... Um, I was very polite. <laughs> yeah, then I was very polite. It was very polite. Big gaps. <laughs> Big gaps. <laughs> no, I mean, I think probably those in the media are the first to criticize the media. There, there are big gaps. When it comes to national security issues, I think I've been really, really lucky um, that I've been allowed to stay on it for 10 years. And, and I can't say it hasn't always been without a bit of a fight. And I'm not sure what to do now, because I'm not sure if that's something we should stay on, focused, or, or if the way I'm arguing that policies need to be more holistic, I should take my reporting to a, a larger area. Um, I think, I think part of the problem is uh, this issue has to be understood in a global perspective. And too often the reporting that we've seen is done solely from, from what you're seeing in Washington. And so if you're covering this beat and you never get out of Washington or Ottawa or London or whatever, I, I, I don't feel you can adequately report on it. But that is the majority of reporting that's being done. The other unfortunate trend is that while I think foreign news is becoming more and more important both as the world gets smaller and because it just impacts domestic news, most news organizations are closing their bureaus. And unfortunately, you know, our paper is one of them. Um, the, the argument uh, goes at, at our paper that um, because foreign postings are, foreign bureaus are so expensive to run, we can then invest that money uh, differently to actually cover more. And it's a hard argument for, for me to argue against, 
because that's actually what I've done. I've always been based in Toronto, and I go off for you know one, two, three, six weeks and come back to that base. But I think why it's worked for me is because I have a narrow focus, I have a beat. Um, whereas I couldn't plop into Zimbabwe and, and report on what's going there just because you know, I've been, I've been to, to Somalia. So what I hope we do, what I hope we do at our paper, and because this is gonna be on the internet, I'll, I'll fast forward to this clip for our editor in chief. Um, but what I, what I hope we do is that we have reporters who get specialties. And, and I think in some ways that could be a better model for foreign reporting as long as we stick to that and keep investing. But reporting just from from, from here and, and trying to explain what's going on elsewhere and how policies affect, I think is really dangerous. Do you see fewer colleagues and competitors ever seen this? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I also think, you know, we've had this great rise of social media and citizen journalism, which is, which is amazing. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm like Emery. Well, actually, I don't think you said you're a Twitter addict. But, okay, got a couple addicts in this room, and we're trying to bring Bart along. But, um, but it, it, it's amazing. It's been an amazing journalistic tool as well. It's really uh, opened up uh, all sorts of avenues. Uh, but we have to be cautious of citizen journalism, too, because so much of what is passed off as journalism really is advocacy. And people on Twitter and elsewhere aren't held to the same standards we're held at. And I think sometimes, you know, it's very trendy to, to um, criticize what, what's called mainstream media, and, and we criticize it as well. But I don't think people appreciate um, the level that we, we you know, we, the, the lengths we go to to uh, verify our information and the ethical code that we have that you might not have from citizen journalists. Got time for one last question. Okay, um, thanks. I really enjoyed your book, and the arc sort of goes, it starts on September 11th and ends with Osama bin Laden's death. But one of the other characters that you talk about is this woman, Tawako Karman, who just was one of the three to win the Nobel Peace Prize. So I guess the question is, and your book is entitled Decade of Fear, with the end of bin Laden and with Tawako Karman and, and the Arab Spring and so forth, a decade on, are we still going to be telling the same story? Could there be a sequel, the second decade of fear? <laughs> or, or is this the end of bin Laden and, and Tawakul Karman, the beginning of, of a new decade, and one where there's at least a little bit of hope? That was, that's my hope. And, and that was part of the reason why I wanted to write the book. Um, it gave me a chance to, to try and put the pieces together. And, and I didn't know how it was going to end. And actually, I had to rewrite the ending three times and hand it in the last draft, May 1st. <laughs> and Obama announced the death of bin Laden that night. Um, <laughs> so, so I begged for more time and got it. But, um, and it made a nice arc for the book, as you mentioned, because I went from ground zero back to ground zero when he uh, went there, Obama went there after bin Laden's death. But you know, I sort of ended on this, this note of, I think what I call cynical optimism, which is, or realistic optimism, which I, I do feel that, and maybe it's just, you know, by my nature to be positive, but I do feel that this is, um, could be a turning point and that the double whammy of um, bin Laden and uh, the Arab Spring really could put us into a new decade that hopefully isn't a decade that's ruled by this politics of fear. Well, that's the right note on which to end. So thank you. Uh, you've certainly whetted the, our appetite for the book, and there is, for any sorts of appetite, uh, a reception in Schultz, uh, and there are books, uh, and Michelle will be signing them, and so we invite you all, let us give both Michelle and Bart a, uh, another hand and come and celebrate.